you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I'd like to ask the um, County Administrative Officer Carlos Palacios if there's any considerations of late additions to the agenda or deletions. Uh, I don't have any corrections. Okay. So before we begin our meeting, uh, we'll open it up for public comment. So any person uh, who's here may address the board on items on consent, items that are not on the agenda, or the regular agenda, but knowing that if you comment on items that are on the regular agenda, you will not be able to comment again when that item is heard. And so with that, I'll open up to the first member of the public who's here with us this afternoon to speak. Hi, um, I wanted to end a letter that was signed by, um, uh, was it 20, 15 organizations? 13 organizations and uh, 122 committee members. Uh, and just distribute that to uh, the county board if possible, as well as staff. Um, so the letter's titled, uh, Budget Our Values, Healthcare and Housing, Not Incarceration. Dear County uh, Board of Supervisors, the recent rise in climate-related disasters has uprooted and changed us. Fires, floods, erosion, and COVID-19 have all wreaked havoc on our lives. The rising cost of housing and health care and enduring inequalities continue to perpetuate negative social impacts in our community. In the face of all this, the current budget deficit is a major challenge. It also is an opportunity, an opportunity for us to come together and to continue to realign ourselves around the values and services that will support our community, focusing our resources in a fiduciary, responsive and sustainable and equitable way. We are constituents from across the county. Parents, students, workers, researchers, artists, faith leaders, teachers, caregivers, renters, healthcare providers, business owners and homeowners, and other professionals. We come from many faiths, cultures, and backgrounds with many skills. And together, we ask you to prioritize equity in our basic needs, shelter and healthcare, particularly behavioral health services. This fiscal year has highlighted outdated status quo budgeting. During the budget hearings, we witnessed a narrative from board members and law enforcement that only policing and incarceration create public safety, while public health was relegated to service provision through grant chasing. In fact, public health is public safety. Housing security, medical treatment, food access, parks and open spaces, community-based uh, organizations, education, and more are all an integral part of what creates public safety. I'm going to continue reading the letter, um, also signing on Pam Sexton. This year's proposed budget includes a staffing increase for the sheriff's department of two positions, and that's on top of five positions added last December. So a total of plus seven alongside, alongside that is a staff cut of 42 positions in the health services agency. We understand the disparity has been defended because many of the cut positions had one time COVID-19 funding. Yet we know there remains a major crisis in county health services, particularly behavioral health. These health needs will only grow if the board does not support our health department during this budget deficit and beyond. We're concerned about the outdated funding framework that proposes 47 plus million dollars for the corrections department. The county jail has a 511 bed total jail capacity with an average daily population from May, it was 313 incarcerated folks. This 31% vacancy, 31% of the beds are empty, highlights the need to deactivate empty units and readjust the corrections budget accordingly. By deactivating an empty 48 bunk unit at Roundtree, for example, the county can save money and offset some of the fiscal deficit. 
helping to fund critical services that are in jeopardy of losing funding. 86% of people in our jails are incarcerated for misdemeanors, generally related to homelessness, substance use disorder, mental health needs. It's time to scale back our investment in jails as a solution to address public health needs and truly invest in public health infrastructure. Hi, thank you. I'm going to continue the letter. I'm Susan Cohen. As elected officials, you have a moral responsibility to ensure the health and well-being of your constituents and the county, even if it goes against your political views, ties, or agenda. We encourage you to support and believe in the community. We ask you to reinvest taxpayer dollars from ineffective and costly incarceration models to alternative programs that center safety through meeting basic needs, support for recovery, and successful reentry into the community. We thank you for your commitment to supporting this participatory process to ensure equity is implemented throughout all sectors of Santa Cruz County. We offer the following five community-driven proposals for your, for your consideration. One, participatory budgeting. First, democratize the budget process by creating a mechanism for budget presentations where the public can vote, voice concerns, questions, rebuttal, and provide solutions while fostering dialogue. Next, one possible mechanism is to create a budget committee where the above can take place and public input can be recorded and presented to the board during these budget hearings for example, as they do in Monterey County. Number two, health infrastructure. Provide direction to launch an impact report on the benefits of building a health and recovery facility that will eliminate the use of the main jail as a de facto mental health institution. The jail should not be a mental health institution as, as it is today. We invest in housing with behavioral health services as a way to prevent arrest due to a lack of basic housing or mental health services, creating a cost-effective strategy that will support alternatives to incarceration for low-level health-related officials offenses. This will reduce the county's dependency on jails as a mental health facility. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura, Laura Chatham, member of the Mental Health Advisory Board. Uh, three, we would like to ask for winter shelters. Fund winter shelters across the county as another way to prevent arrests, provide needed services to those coming out of jail to prevent recidivism, support those who are impacted by homelessness and provide life-saving shelter to those in need during extreme weather occurrences. Four, reinstate contact visits. Reinstate weekly co family contact visits at Roundtree facilities and Blaine Street back to the pre-pandemic levels. In the years before COVID-19, the Sheriff's Office staffing levels were well below today's staffing levels. Five, reduce corrections expenditure. Reduce the corrections budget by deactivating beds specifically the Roundtree unit that is non-operative and readjusting the budget accordingly. The state of California provided precedent by recently deactivating unused prison units, saving $80 million with no impact to community safety or employment. Reinvest these dollars in aforementioned recommendations and support life-affirming services. Reduce the general fund contribution to the corrections department by 10%. Reinvest these savings in current non-carceral anti-recidivism practices and approaches that are producing positive and viable outcomes. Thank you very much for your time. We hope you really do consider what we're asking. Good afternoon. My name is Barry Domer. I supervise the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program. And as you may recall from my attendance at previous Board of Supervisors meetings, the Family Stabilization Program serves approximately 250 Santa Cruz families living in crisis each year. 
We provide intensive crisis management services to families experiencing mental health issues and trauma, homelessness, domestic violence, and other barriers to safety and self-sufficiency. Our program helps parents to become employed, self-sufficient, and to get off public, public assistance. I've come by again today to thank you for advocating for family stabilization at the state level, as well as the local level in case the FS allocation is eliminated. I understand that you're all incredibly busy and that your plates are full with the many proposed budget cuts. All of this makes me feel all the more grateful to you for your time and your efforts. Please keep family stabilization and the 116 families that we're currently serving in mind as you make important local budgeting decisions on this last day of budget hearings and beyond. And then finally, I've been a social worker serving Santa Cruz County families for 24 years, and I've seen many changes in that time. My fear at this time, however, is that if we lose family stabilization and other safety net services, the harmful impacts on families would be unlike anything any of us have seen. I am very hopeful that if we continue to advocate together that this will not have to come to pass. Thank you again for your preventative efforts. Uh Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Uh, Bernie Gomez with Milpa District 3. Uh, finally made it in person. I know I've you know been online and stuff. So first off, I want to say uh, gracias to Carlos, his staff, uh, Marcus Pimentel and, and uh, staff, right, uh, for the hard work that you guys put in, you know, uh, year after year. Uh, and I'm going to continue to speak on the, the, the letter that was read. Um, one is... You know, we're trying to figure out how this uh, this county runs its process, right? Its budgeting process, um, and we believe that the public, the public's voice needs to be present. You know, uh, we need to. We have a lot of questions, a lot of rebuttals, good things to say. You know, and um, here is it. We don't. We don't, we're not allotted that time or that uh, opportunity. You know, and um, so that's one. You know, just figuring out how do we get, how do we create a mechanism, right, where we get uh, before. The public here to start are are going on right. That information is coming to you. You know, um, another one too is uh, the whole thing around the sheriff's office, right, and incarceration specifically. You know, a lot of times people start thinking about, well, this is like an anti uh, police, anti sheriff, you know, all that type of narrative. You know, but this is not the case. The case is that the da the data, right, that's before us, that is in this county, right, is just. It's telling us a story, you know. It's telling us that there is a decline in crime, right. There's a lot of less people are going. Uh, are um, are being are going to jail, right? Uh, but a lot more people are struggling with substance abuse, right? With those public health issues, you know. Um, and more often than not, public health and public safety is uh, uh, often pitted against each other. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's a good opportunity for us to uh, rethink, you know, rethink and re and readjust uh, the the practices that are that have been ongoing, you know. Uh, we live in a new a new age, you know. So the new age deserves new uh, new approaches. Uh, but with the public's uh, effort, support, you know, we want to work together. You know what I'm saying? So we can create viable solutions and opportunities for all of us to thrive, you know, and be healthy. So thank you very much. <laughs> Members of the board, it's good to see you again. You know me. I'm Max. I'm the president of SCIU 521. I've met with many of you personally. I first spoke to you a year ago in response to the grand jury's report that had pretty conclusive uh, descriptions of the problems facing Santa Cruz County Public Health Services, understaffed, underfunded, overworked. In the last couple of weeks, I've met with you as well, where we've discussed options, budget, concerns. We talked about principally the idea that again and again, it is demonstrated in the research and in the real world that it costs more money to be cruel than it does to be kind and provide services. These fine folks today have outlined a number of examples of preventative services that can save the county money. Two weeks ago, the Family Stabilization Program was a perfect example of a program that saves you money. My program and the work that my coworkers do is a perfect example of a program that saves you money. Hopefully, your inboxes have been inundated with far too many messages to read 
in the last couple of days, so I don't expect you to have read them. But if you deep dive into some of them, particularly some of the longer ones, you will see members of my union, members of my workforce talking about resigning, transferring away from emergency services, burn, burning out, being burned out, and being done. Today, you have an opportunity to fix that by setting aside a portion of the budget to go into negotiations by setting aside a portion of the budget to preserve the family stabilization program by setting aside a portion of the budget to build these programs that will save you money endlessly year after year for as long as you maintain them please do not squander this opportunity thank you Hi, members of the board. My name is Liam McLaughlin. I'm uh, staff with SKU Five to One. Just want to first, you know, be in solidarity with everyone here who's, um, you know, pointing out that the data shows that you know preventative care is always, always, always cheaper in the long run than reactive uh, care. And all the work that uh, our, our our members um, with SKU Five to One at the county do is preventative care. Uh, so um, the more we invest in those public services, right, the the, the cheaper. Um, you know, the costs in the long run. Um, and then second, I, I just had two um, two questions generally to ponder as we're adopting a budget. Um, we know statewide there is a budget crisis. Um, we as an organization, SEIU, has been up in Sacramento. We're going up next Tuesday again, uh, you know, five or six times this year to fight back against those cuts. Um, so we're, we're really doing our part to try to, um, you know, make sure that funding stays here. But uh, if any of those services are cut, is there um, a plan to kind of mitigate the impact of those proposed cuts on the statewide budget here in the county? Uh, that's kind of the first question. And then second, in general, you know, we know that negotiations are coming up in September, uh, not only with, with our unit, but with many units. Um, is there kind of room in this budget? Is, is, is the board and the, the CAO and management kind of investing in room in this budget for a fair contract to fill the vacancies to serve uh, the community? Um, so I'll leave you with that, and, and thanks for your work. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Mark Warner, native son of Santa Cruz. Um, my family's been here since the 1820s. There's a housing problem here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, it'd be so easy to plant a pole in the ground and say, this is where the homeless could stay. This is what the mayor of Washington, D.C. did not too long ago. You could do the same thing and save the county a lot of money. Also, defund law enforcement and refund the community. Thank you. Good afternoon, excuse me. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings and Supervisors. I'm Bruce Van Allen. I'm on the advisory board of the Tennis Sanctuary, and I'm here to express our appreciation for the board's support for Tennis Sanctuary, um, and in the hopes that you'll continue um, to provide that. Um, I wanted to. I think you all know that landlords and tenants sometimes need to be reminded of their responsibilities and their rights, and at some point a conflict or a dispute can actually get to where it has to go to court. And this is where the county's contract with Tennis Sanctuary has been crucial. And I want to give you um, just a couple little anonymized um, examples of where your contract has come through for people of Santa Cruz. The first one is a, a group of tenants consisted of two families living in the same building, but in two different units. Both received eviction notices, which they felt were invalid. One family also experienced discriminatory remarks from the property management company due to perceived race and immigration status. Through our attorneys funded by the county, advising and representation, those families received $15,000 each in settlements plus an additional month to move out. A second anonymized example, a tenant was advised by our attorney while also being referred to our organizational partner, the Conflict Resolution Center, and through their services, the tenant receives a $6,000 settlement from the landlord over a dispute. And a third example, a tenant worked with our attorney um, after receiving an eviction unlawful detainer 
for being in violation of lease. The tenant and those living with the tenant had nowhere to go and faced potential homelessness. The tenant sanctuary staff attorney negotiated stipulation with the opposing party's attorney for the tenant and those living with them to have a two month extension of the lease and as long as they as long as they paid rent to help them find another place to go. This is an example of where it does sometimes take an attorney able to go into court and to help resolve the dispute makes a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I just noticed you removed the plexiglass here. Thank you. That's significant. Thank you. Um, I live in the rural area and I'm here to speak for the rural residents. You heard many of them from Mountain Charlie Road and Paulson Road this morning. And um, I'm here to voice my concern for rural residents who are not getting funding from um, for roads. Um, the county promised Measure K money would fund road repair. The county promised voters Measure G sales tax money would fund roads. And the county promised Measure D road money would go to fund roads. Now, none of that is going to go to repair local roads now. That's not acceptable. Instead, the, the, uh, the contingency money is going to be used essentially to pay down the debt service for the $95 million this county has to borrow. I, you can't go back now. Westridge property has been built and now people are there, but it's not, it's basically empty. It's not providing a broad range of services for the people in the South County. I toured it last week and I was shocked. I want to see money uh, dedicated to road repair, especially the Mountain Charlie and the Paulson Road. That has to happen and our county needs to be giving um, more cash money to those projects. They are emergencies. I also think that the budget county budget website does not provide a good level of information for the public. For example, uh, regarding Prop 172 public safety money, you cannot find it. I had to ask here at the hearings last week and found out the sheriff is getting eight million. The DA is getting. 3 million and county fires getting zero once again, zero for our county fire volunteer fire department. This is unacceptable. Please fund county fire with Prop 172 money. We're being told now that the last tax measure was not enough. Thank you. All right, is there any other member of the public who hasn't spoken already here in chambers with, that would like to speak to us at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's any online speakers. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Antonia, your microphone is now available. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Antonia Bradford, and I am a Boulder Creek resident. Um, I wanted to make a comment today about the proposed road budget. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Supervisor Conant for his statement at the last meeting about how infusing zero of our tax dollars into our road repair and maintenance is absolutely unacceptable. Um, our roads are not being made the priority that they are. I've looked at the numbers, I've read the news, and I get that we have a lot of serious financial challenges. But as a CZU fire survivor, I was told over and over when it came to people rebuilding, the county had an obligation and a commitment to public safety, which was a narrative that obstructed many from rebuilding. The situation over at Mount Charlie Road, which is supposed to be a county maintained road, is an opportunity for the county to show that commitment. During the CCU fire onset, our law enforcement performed a beautiful and seamless evacuation of Boulder Creek, and that was possible because of the safety of the roads. If there was a fire in the region of Mountain Charlie Road, most assuredly different results would transpire. As a member of the California fire survivor community, I know many, many people from the Paradise community, and that is not a nightmare that anyone in our area wants to experience. I can assure you of that, and the county certainly doesn't want to have that responsibility on their hands. Our roads get us to work, they get our kids to school, they allow for safe passage during a crisis. By neglecting our roads, it is creating a mental health crisis for those affected. It affects property values, but above all, it puts our fellow neighbors at risk. Please consider shifting some of the money into the budget for the roads so that we can all be safe and prosper equitably. Thank you. Eileen, your microphone is now available. Thank you. 
My, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Eileen Clark Nagoka, and I'm a resident of Watsonville. Um, I'd also like to speak to the letter that was uh, writ read earlier, um, and and uh, second that the 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 opinion that uh, there's that we need uh, a better balance and and. Uh, 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 between the, uh, to address the dis discrepancy between um, social services and incarceration. I'd also like to speak to the development of the budget and um, and to propose that, uh, as was mentioned in the letter, the people's uh, budget process. Many communities are using this, Hayward, Redwood City, Merced County, um, so that we have a way to address the budget before it's finalized. We need a way for the public voice to be invited in to create the budget and not just uh, at the end when it's already when it's already been presented to us. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. And just wanna thank everybody for providing their input here in person and online today. Uh, before I bring it back to the board for um, discussion, I just wanted to see if there's any um, comments that could be made on some of the questions that were brought up around the state budget cuts and how that might impact uh, workers here in the county. There's a um, question about um, contract negotiations. And then I'm wondering if maybe someone could speak to the budget process because this is a very long process that starts with our mid-year budget meetings in kind of like January, February, and then we have other budget sessions uh, throughout the course of the year. So I'm just wondering if we can speak to those items really briefly. Yeah, we have, um, if you'd like, we, during our budget presentation, we have all those issues oh, covered. Great. We can, okay. Would... That, that, that resolves that. And then I don't know if there's any response to some of the other, oh, so the other issues around state. We're going to address all of those in the budget presentation. Great. Item number 10. Great. All right. Um, well, with that, then we'll move no, on. Rather. Item seven. So item seven. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. And so I wonder if any members of the board have any questions or comments on consent? Okay, seeing none, then I'll ask the, see if there's a motion on the consent agenda. Move approval of consent. All right, so we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, seconded by Supervisor Friend to uh, approve the consent agenda. And so with that, I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. So the consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you all so much. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to item number six. <clears throat> Consider resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule for fiscal year 2024-25 as provided in the reference budget documents. And I'll turn it over to um, our finance team for the presentation on this item. For the item six, the unified fee schedule, yes. and then we'll go into the budget, overall budget after that. So uh, Marcus Femidel, your county budget manager. I'm here with uh, Gina D. Kuhn, Dina, Gina D. Martini Kuhn um, from our office, senior administrative analyst. Uh, I'm going to begin with just recapping. This is our, our fourth day of budget hearings. Uh, they began on April 9th. Um, you just reviewed the consent calendar. What we're going to do next is step into the unified fee schedule process. And then following the unified fee schedule, public hearing, we'll move into the last day actions, public hearing, or into the public hearing uh, for unified fee schedule. So every year the staff bring forward changes to the unified fee schedule. This is done typically twice a year in December and in June. Uh, the board looked and, and made updates uh, this past December and there are some additional updates in June. This is done annually as a point of time to identify fees that are falling behind the cost for which it takes to so to uh, provide services for those fees. We we also ensure that we are not over collecting fees that exceed the cost of providing the services. So in today's presentation, we have various nominal fee adjustments for some of the departments that we're really the agents that bring it together, but we have departmental staff who are available should you have any questions regarding their specific things. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gina. Gina DiMartini Coons, analyst in the County Administrative Office. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings and members of the board. 
The unified fee schedule serves as a single location listing departmental fees and changes as authorized by state law or local authority and approved by the board. Annually in June and December, the board consider amend considers amendments to the unified fee schedule. The recommended fee increases are based on changes to the consumer price index, the analysis of projected salaries, benefits, and overhead costs of providing products or services, the cost of enforcing regulations, or based on state or federal mandates. The board report contains details by department on the changes for the agricultural commissioner, uh, community development and infrastructure, county clerk, health services agency, human services department, information services, parks, open spaces, and cultural services, and the sheriff coroner's office. Thank you. With that, the, the agenda packet included the detail um, in the board report, as well as the attached exhibits outlining the, all the changes in the various fees. And with that, that concludes our staff presentation. We now turn it over to the board to conclude the public hearing and take the uh, staff recommended, recommended actions. All right, thank you very much. With that, we'll open up the public hearing. Uh, let's see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, you'll have two minutes and you can approach the podium at this time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I am aware of these fees and I'm aware that the county is looking at uh, restructuring them. That was the reason given to the county fire Department Advisory Commission for a 300% increase in billing to County Fire from General Services Department. It went from $10,000 a year to $332,000 a year. I guess that's more than 300%. Anyway, um, I, I take a protest to that. And I also want to ask your board to consider reducing the fees for members of the public to appeal issues to you. It costs $1,900 for someone to bring an appeal before you, and that's only to see if you're going to take it up. That is a, a real barrier to members of the public who would like to do that. I, I know of one such, such example that just happened. They could not afford any more because they had already gone to the planning commission with an appeal, which has a big fee and paid attorney fees, and they were simply out of money. Their attorney told them that they really should have brought it to you to exhaust their remedies, but they simply couldn't afford to do it. So you are public servants. Making it available for people, members of the public, to appeal things to you should not cost $1,900. Please consider reducing that fee. I also am aware that um, a few years ago, the fee for Public Records Act requests USBs was uh, $24 for a USB. That's a little high. And I don't know if that's been changed, but those kinds of fees are prohibitive for members of the public to simply find out more about what is going on in their government and for holding you accountable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's anybody online who'd like to speak to us on this item. We have no speakers online, Chair. Sure. All right, well then we'll close the public hearing. We'll bring it back to the board for any um, questions, action and deliberation. So let's see if any board members have any comments or questions. Seeing none. I'll move the fee schedule, the recommended actions. So we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson to move the recommended actions. I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Hernandez is absent. Uh, McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously with Supervisor, Mc, uh, Supervisor Hernandez absent. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item number seven, uh, last day, um, and concluding report for the proposed 2024-25 budget. I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Mr. Pemintel, for the presentation on this item. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and start uh, this sure. presentation uh, by addre addressing some of the questions you raised, uh, Chair Cummings, and the, and the public comments, uh, and one of the most important things facing us is the status of the state budget. 
um, it's very much in flux right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the governor proposed his budget. Um, the May revise came out in mid-May. Uh, the legislature has proposed, has submitted a counter proposal, which undoes a lot of the cuts proposed by the governor. And now there are uh, ongoing negotiations. I've asked um, directors um, Randy Morris, Human Services Department, and Monica Morales, Health Services Agency Director, to come and address in particular the status of the state budget regarding their particular associations from their departments. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cummings and board members and the public here. Um, first, I want to uh, double up on some of what um, people spoke to, including one of my own employees. Appreciation to the board for writing a letter after our human services um, budget presentation. And you wrote a letter, one of many, many elected officials and organizations, including my state association, um, urging the governor and the state legislature to reject many of the cuts to the safety net. As um, Carlos just mentioned, uh, we were trending towards eight plus million dollars of cuts if the may revise cuts held the state legislature specifically rejected over 90 percent of those proposed cuts and now the governor and the legislature are in negotiations and we are waiting anxiously so if the legislature's rejections hold and move forward the impacts are much much smaller on community-based organization contracts and on staffing if they returned a portion of them, then we'll have to come back with some details, but we're very pleased by the legislature's actions. Um, I do wanna recognize um, our family stabilization unit and supervisor who've been here. That is one of the priority items of our state association and our legislature has stepped up and said they do not want those programs cut. So we are continuing send lenders uh, letters. My state association urged us this weekend and I sent a letter yesterday so advocacy continues, you know how state politics work out, and we are hearing there might be some settlement of the governor and the state legislature as early as end of week. So we're watching closely and we will be tracking and reporting to everyone once we know how that settles. And I'll let Monica speak to health and I'm happy to answer any other specific questions. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I echo everything Randy said. Probably something a little bit different is that for public health, we are seeing a cut still being negotiated, as Randy outlined, of about $300 million across the state um, for public health efforts. This would translate for us locally uh, about $1.4 uh, $1 million in our public health department. We're monitoring that. Um, again, negotiations will happen. The 15th is a big date for us that we're going to be monitoring for. Um, just to see how things go. The other pieces that um, don't directly impact the core programming, uh, but still a huge hit for us is the changes on the behavioral health infrastructure money. So I've uh, presented last week on some of those impacts. So for example, right now, we're using some of that for the bridge, uh, behavioral health bridge housing, the 34 um, units that we're building, that will be impacted for other long-term projects. Our youth crisis stabilization programming that we uh, leverage the beat chip, that's also impacted. So again, those are not part of the negotiation. And so it will be for us almost like a pause on the infrastructure pieces for behavioral health. We are leaning to see what happens with Prop 1 on the good and the bad. On the good is how the bond's going to play out, how much money will actually come to our county. All of that's still being up for um, the RFP process. All of that guidance is still um, being drafted as we speak. So Lots of changes for behavioral health, and we'll be coming to the board shortly as we learn more and more on uh, some of those impacts. Okay, thank you very much. Um, did you have board have any questions for them, or just on the health services, for instance? You're dependent. Uh, the revenues that you spend on health services, I mean, we're dependent eighty or percent plus on what the state and feds give us. Is that right? Absolutely. It's actually about 93, 94% of our funding comes through um, grants or uh, Medi-Cal reimbursement. Yeah. So that's, as was mentioned, that's the tremendous uncertainty of what the state in particular, but the federal government as well, is going to be doing in these programs, um, which we don't know exactly the answer at this point. 
Right. I mean, we're also not highlighting, for example, there's workforce cuts, right, that we know will be detrimental in terms of building the pipeline that we so desperately need in this county. There's also small things that we're monitoring, but it impacts for us, like our acupuncture programming that we have in clinics. That also is part of the Medi-Cal reimbursement. Um, so we're monitoring some of those as well. But very much for us in limbo at this point, monitoring what happens in strong advocacy uh, across the state for these programs. Other questions or comments? Well, just let us know what we can do to continue to help and support you all. And um, I'm glad we were able to get that letter out and to see that uh, that the legislature is really pushing back on this as well. And hopefully, you know, we as one small county with all the other counties out there advocating for these programs to stay in place will make a difference. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And I know there were some uh, questions about road funding. So if we could put that slide up. Um, <laughs> So this is in the memo I provided the board uh, regarding road funding um, in in the budget. Um, as the board is aware, uh, we have faced an unprecedented number of federally declared natural disasters, seven over the past uh, six years, which is unprecedented. Uh, major storms in 2017, uh, the fires of 2020, which was the worst fire the county has ever experienced. And then 2023, there was two major storms. Um, so that in, in itself, due to climate change, is wreaking havoc on the county infrastructure. So since 2017, uh, we have spent uh, $349 million on roads. Um, some of this money was spent on routine uh, road maintenance and non-disaster work. Um, but almost half of it was spent on um, disaster response. So we've, uh, in fact, responded to 282 storm damage road repairs that were completed since 2017, 282. Uh, some of them are culvert uh, repairs. Some of them are bridge uh, bridges that are washed out. Some of them are landslides. Um, just the list goes on and on. We have lists and lists of all the repairs that have been made, um, many of most of them, many of them in the mountains, not all of them, though. For example, Main Street and Soquel was one of the one of the projects we responded to as well as all of the projects that we've had in the mountains as well. So that's really unprecedented. It's hard for us to get our mind around that, but that we as a county actually fixed 282 separate road projects that were due to the storm events, the unprecedented storm events that we've been uh, facing uh, since 2017. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. So this is how our uh, how we spent the money. And you can see that regular, regular road funding uh, was 123 million, um, but on 22, 23 storms, the two events, we've spent um, almost $72 million. On 2017, $89 million. And then since, uh, many, much of this was debris removal on roads, uh, was 13.6 million. Um, so you can see that all of the different, and then the regular measure D projects as well, 16 million. You can go to the next slide. This is the road funding. The first thing to note is that we spent 349 million since 2017. We only had 297 million in resources. So we actually overspent the budget. We overspent the budget by more than $50 million on roads uh, because it was such a uh, high priority of the county. And this was because we were faced with these emergency responses, roads washed out across the county again. And so you can see that we're using, leveraging all of our resources, some of it used for regular road repair, but much of it is being used uh, for, for matching funds for um, FEMA and other projects that are emergency responses. For example, SB1, which is the state um, gas tax and vehicle license fee, you can see that we, we over the last seven years, we've received 28 million. Um, that was really meant when it was passed for regular road repair. Uh, when the state passed it, it was because the gas tax was losing money, so they wanted to increase it. Uh, and so SB1 is a result of that. We get about, I think it's about $6 million a year, $5.8 million a year. We're using almost all of it as match money for emergency response, as opposed to just regular road repair. And again, it's because of the necessity of that. So again, we spent 349 million 
we had 297 million in resources. We overspent the money budget by 50 some million. And that's why we had to issue a bond to try and make up the difference. You can go to the next slide. So in the 2020, 24, 25 budget, I know there was a comment online that we have no money in for roads. That's not true. We actually have $83 million uh, in, in the budget for roads. Um, we have $11 million for 2023 storm damage projects. That's 32 projects. Uh, 10.5 million for 2017 storms. That's 31 projects. So that's, we have to stop and think about that. We're still repairing 2017 damage to the, and this next year, we're still going to be working on 2017. Uh, and then you can see that we have um, road and traffic repairs, road resurfacing, um, bridge repairs, and regular road maintenance. Uh, so anyway, that's that lays out what's in the budget. And then you can go to the next slide. I guess, I guess actually, that's the last slide. Thank you. So anyway, I just wanted to provide that information um, to the board. Uh, it's a dilemma because we still have... Um, <coughs> over 80 projects that are not funded yet. And so um, these are uh, storm damage projects, uh, mainly from 2023 and then the new ones that happened in 2024. So what we are, um, what one of the solutions to this uh, issue that we've been facing is um, having FEMA uh, reimburse us more quickly. The way that uh, emergency road repair works is that the local government uh, goes, goes and gets approved for the project and then actually finishes the project and then gets reimbursed. Federal Highways is reimbursing us within one to two years, which is actually great. Uh, but mo most of our roads are FEMA roads, local county roads. They're not Federal Highway roads. The majority of our roads are FEMA roads. And FEMA is taking anywhere from five to six years to reimburse us. Just to give you an example, from 2023, those two storm events, uh, we still do not have one obligation yet. Not one project is obligated yet from FEMA. Uh, it's it's pretty shocking. Uh, almost, you know, more than a year later, we still don't have one obligation yet. And the obligation is the very first step to get reimbursed because you have to get the obligation and then you actually get the claim and then you get reimbursed. So the problem is that we just are having cash flow problems. So that's, and again, that's why we overspent our budget. That's why we issued a bond is that we're actually leveraging the county's debt to complete more projects. Uh, but we've reached a, a problem that we are not getting reimbursed fast enough. And therefore, even with the bond, we, we still have over 80 projects that are not yet funded. So the big solution is to get FEMA to, to act quicker, more quickly, uh, act like federal highways. And that's all they need to do. And we'd be great shape. Uh, the other way that is that we're working with Cal OES, uh, the Office of Emergency S Services, to give us advances on FEMA uh, funds that are obligated. So they have done that in the past where they have given us the county advances pending the reimbursement from FEMA on uh, projects that are obligated. So what we're hoping as, as, is that as we get 2023 projects obligated, we will get advances and then we'll be able to tackle um, those projects and then also the projects that are still unfunded. And so we have received two $9 million advances from Cal OES. And I'll tell you, I think we probably have received more money than anybody in the state for advances from Cal OES. I think we're setting, uh, we're trailblazing here. But they seem to be assuring us that as soon as we get obligations from FEMA, they will advance the money. So that's very hopeful. So that's what we want to do is get those obligations in on 2023, get those advances in, and then we can start tackling the projects that are still unfunded. So anyway, I just wanted to pro provide the board that background on the road since I know that was raised um, both this morning and, and in public comment uh, this afternoon. And then we have uh, the budget presentation where Director Pimentel can go through the budget schedule as well. Uh, I know those were questions about what are the public hearings that we have in the budget and what are the opportunities for the public to to comment. Yep. Uh, Chair, might I just ask a question or two on the, the roads sure. items? Um, so clearly we're doing an incredible amount of work on roads and the, I mean, the need has never been greater. I mean, 280 plus storm damage repair sites and, uh, you know, just recent memory, it's, it's incredible. I mean, and the response to uh, the 2023 uh, disasters in particular was 
really uh, admirable, I think, by all county staff. And, you know, I mean, this is my fourth budget year. Um, and I think part of the reason I have never raised this as an issue before is because you're right. I mean, there's all there's a ton of money going into roads, um, but there's also a lot of funding sources to do that. Uh, I mean, whether it's that highway users tax, um, you know, measure D local sales tax dedicated specifically to transportation, um, you know, these FEMA funds uh, for roads. Um, and there's still a big shortfall. And so my question um, here is, well, how much of this is actually our discretionary general funds that we contribute to roads every year? I think that there was a table uh, in the report on roads items as transfers in, um, and but it was blank for 23, 24, and I'm unclear how much uh, we'd be allocating in 24, 25. Yeah, so in the budget, um, there's $83 million total allocated for road projects. So that's in the budget we're asking to be approved today. And of that, um, $11 million is approximately what could be attributed to the general fund. Seven of that amount of money is due to um, the debt that we're issuing. That's not covered by the by the gas tax fund, the roads fund. So basically, the way the general fund is contributing this year is by assuming debt. Um, that part of the bond that's being issued. Um, so anyway, and th and then the other way is that we're doing internal borrowing as well. So we're actually doing internal borrowing, um, and that is partly also backed by the general fund ultimately. So I would attribute eleven million dollars of the general fund obligation of that eighty-three million. All right, and the other four or so million is that going towards storm damage repair or what? Um, yeah, the some of it's storm drain, some of it's regular road me, um, projects like Measure D projects, road resurfacing, and there's a number of projects that are regular road projects as well that are going on. So, um, so I mean, actually, if I could direct a question to Director Machado, because um, I was just at a Firewise event, and um, you know, the local uh, fire marshal for uh, Central Fire was saying, yeah, the news is this year, uh, county's not doing mowing along the roads. And I know we are, there is a 16% reduction in our regular road maintenance budget, which typically handles uh, mowing. But um, you know, that was sort of a concerning word on the street. Can you, I mean, maybe if you could provide A, a little bit more clarity on the other $4 million there beyond debt service of our general uh, discretionary general fund monies that are going towards roads, and then also speak a little bit to uh, our current road maintenance budget. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the board. Uh, Matt Machado, uh, Director of CDI. So the $4 million, the, the difference that you were talking about there uh, are mostly project-specific. And I'll give two examples that come straight to my mind. Uh, Soquel Drive, buffer bike lanes, there is a significant general fund contribution to that project. Another project that comes to my mind is Green Valley uh, Roadway, the the bike, the dedicated bike path. There is a significant general fund contribution to that project, and so that's going to be the lion's share of that funding for this proposed year. With regard to reduced maintenance, uh, it is true uh, there's going to be a slight reduction, 16%. That's the right number, uh, and that will be a mix of reduced vegetation maintenance and reduced. Um, surface maintenance, pothole repairs, and it's being driven by uh, us needing to slightly redirect our staff to more uh, project-specific needs. Some of that is levy maintenance down on the Pajaro River uh, that's funded, and so we're in a sense chasing the funds to fund our staff because of this is actually being driven mostly because of declining uh, gas taxes. This is what's driving the reduction in maintenance. The other, um, the other thing that we'll be focusing on is, is some smaller storm damage repair that the crews can can undertake, and that will be funded from funded by uh, FEMA and Federal Highways. So that's the the slight diversion of maintenance, and it's due to declining gas taxes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's just I, th I think as I mentioned, this came up during a fire event, and so it points to the fact that. Maintaining roads is not just filling potholes, it's also reducing fire risk. Um, and in fact, I mean, I asked uh, our CAL FIRE chief 
uh, for you know kind of what their priority list is as far as reducing fire risk in our community, right? Because this is a very hot topic, uh, and I guess pun intended, um, given how many folks in our mountain areas are losing, I mean, or our entire county are losing insurance. What can we do to become a risk, uh, a fire uh, safe community as a county? Um, and our Cal Fire Chief pointed out, well, um, our number one item is roads because 90% of all fires statewide are ignited within 10 feet of a roadway. So, um, I mean, I was concerned to hear that we're reducing our regular road maintenance budget. Um, and, you know, even at $11 million of our general fund, discretionary general fund revenues, I mean, that's 5% or less. And so I recognize that historically we have not directed a lot of discretionary general fund revenues towards road maintenance. But I mean, as we heard today, it's the number one county service that our rural residents depend on. Um, and I think we need to seriously consider changing that because at the end of the day, it's fire risk reduction, it's access to medical services. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's the way everyone from, you know, as we heard again this morning, lawyers, uh, civil engineers, parents, uh, bankers, get to work to make money to pay the property taxes. And if we don't take care of our roads, it is going to impact property values again, as we heard this morning. Um, and I just don't know how we can ensure that the county budget uh, stays in good health going forward if we don't uh, uphold those property values, which drive so much of our general fund. Okay, I'm going to see if we can redirect. I appreciate those comments. I do want to see if we can get through the presentation so we can have a more broader discussion about this and also hear from the public who haven't been able to speak to us on this item. So I'd like to bring it back to um, Mr. Pimentel so we can move forward with the presentation then we'll be able to have a, a broader discussion on this topic. Thank you, Chair Cummings. Um, what you'll see is some slides that look really familiar to you. We, we, I just wanted to recap some, where we've been throughout this year on the, our, our challenges, our successes, uh, what's in the final budget, and then we'll conclude with the budget season, uh, the but as, as mentioned by Carlos Palacios, CEO Palacios, the budget season really starts, you know, years before with a strategic plan and an operational plan that sets the trajectory for where we focus our resources. Then every year we have numerous opportunities throughout the year. The mid year is probably the first of the coming cycle to talk about. So we presented to this board on February 13th, a mid year presentation that had the status of the current year, as well as the first outlook into next year and an updated forecast model. We then move into budget hearings. Our, our first official budget hearing began on April 9th. Um, in years past, it might have just been a consent item, but now we actually hold a budget hearing earlier in the year, April 9th. So we have a public hearing and, and receive feedback. That's then continued um, where a lot of times residents will reach out to um, yourselves and other members of, of staff between April 9th and the departmental budget hearings. We had two days of departmental budget hearings on May 21st and 22nd. Uh, that was a week ago. Um, and then today we're concluding with, with budget hearings on day four. You might recall uh, in years past, the budget hearing would have felt really condensed. You might have received a report um, on the consent and then had budget hearings the last week of June and then the last Tuesday of June, budget adoption. So it was really a condensed period. So we have elongated, allowed for you know feedback in February, budget hearings start in April, departmental hearings in May, and then we conclude in April. So we really are June. So we really stretched it over about a three month period, the, the process for our budget hearings. So where I just want to recap, again, some of these slides you'll see in the public, we'll see them from our May 22nd presentation is we've had a lot of successes. And at times we, we struggle with rem reminding ourselves about the successes our county's achieved. We went into great detail in those, uh, discussing those successes on April 9th. It's feeling like a little deja vu for one of our bond presentations not too long ago. Um, but on April 9th, we wanted to deep detail. There's a lot of in the budget report and in that presentation. I encourage our community members to go through that April 9th presentation. And you can see in detail some of the successes we've had. Um, this presentation will also be attached and there's some information in the board report to that. Yeah, the slides aren't up right now. Here, what would you prefer? I mean, a lot of this is recap. I can I can speak to the slides. 
Um, the slide decks are in the May 21st and 22nd presentation. So I can kind of walk you through that. If we can just pause for a second and make sure, sure that the video feed is still rolling, that we still have Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks like we got the. I'm video. here. I'm here. I had, a, I had to log off for a little bit and log back on because the hotel kicked me off the video feed, but I could hear, but I'm back on. And you guys could see me, right? Uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, I could. Okay. It looks like uh, I think the clerk can see you on there too. So we're good. So we're good to go. Okay. Yeah, so again, without going into uh, these, the, our successes in greater detail, I, I do want to talk about. Um, some of the things that we we're still working through and you heard from our health services agency director uh, monica morales about the concerns with our new child crisis residential unit and we still have pathways to get there but it's just one of the many elements that we're being impacted by the state uh, the state development um, but we are we have made an incredible progress in this community um, you just heard about all the success on road recovery um, through numerous natural disasters that we've had to suffer through uh, some of the challenges again we can we can talk and about where the state budget is for uh, a, quite a long time, but I'll summarize with uh, every year the, the governor proposes a May revise to their January proposal. Often the legislature will propose amendments. This is a year I don't recall, maybe it's a short term memory, but I don't recall the substantial of a deviation between the governor's May revise and the legislature's response. So that is uh, welcoming because of some of those impacts we're gonna really impact our departmental services. So it's gonna be interesting to see where the state goes to bringing forth an adopted budget by next Saturday as they're required to do. But typically after the state adopts their budget by June 15th, they'll then have a couple weeks of final negotiations for what we call the junior budget bill one that will be approved by June 30th. And then they'll go into July and August trailer bills where they're discussing and having more negotiations at the state level between the legislature and the governor July and August. And we'll, we might end up seeing a trade, a budget junior trade bill number two um, by August. So we're really in a time period where we're, we are in flux and I don't remember this much flux. So, you know, staff across the county departments and staff in the CEO's office are closely monitoring all the new proposals. And so far the trend is good. It's, it's, it's a better outcome than we saw a couple of weeks ago, but we'll still see where the final negotiations go the June 15th to the June 30th iteration, and then ultimately the final trailer bills and budget junior bill and probably in August. As this board has heard, and we've talked about quite a bit, our funding levels, we have numerous slides on this. Um, we are systematically underfunded, uh, property tax, sales tax, all of our basic allocations. We're on the wrong end of the spectrum. We, we receive about $460 per capita on, in property tax. Uh, other agencies are higher to 2000 to 4000 to 6000 per capita. And we serve a greater portion of the population. 50% of the county's population lives in the unincorporated county. 20% is more the, the average across California. So we, we serve more than most and we get less than most. So that's a bad recipe for being able to provide for everything we need as, as a county agency who provides both municipal and countywide services. An illustration of that that we've talked about with this board is if we just had the state average allocation, so residents don't pay anything different, it's just if the allocation were the, the, the average across the state, uh, that would be $36 million more every year into the county's general fund. If we had Monterey County's allocation, we'd be about $80 million more every year. So it's just the, these allocation formulas are baked from 19, the 1970s with Prop 13. Um, they're not easy to reform, but it's a, we're just trying to explain the narrative of, of why we are so impacted. Our general fund, we do have a, a, a decent reserve, uh, about 10.5%, uh, $79.4 million funded, as we talked about before. We're reliant on $40 million of that is, is attributed to Medi-Cal funding that's meant for Medi-Cal populations. Uh, when those projects are ultimately built, we'll have we'll have to manage that that impact to our reserves. But right now, we are relying on our on on some of those Medi-Cal funding to strengthen up our reserves. Without that Medi-Cal funding, our reserves drop in half to about 5.1 percent. Our forecast that we'll be updating with the September 24th next budget actions, we still see this inverse bell curve where we peak with a deficit of around 20 million dollars by 26-27, so two years from now. Um, and then that that right now the models currently show that deficit shrinking. So if you hang around by 2032, 33, we'll be in better times, but we still have a little bit of work to do uh, before then. And as we've talked about, it's it's really the the magnitude of the state unfunded mandates and the new changes in state funding that has really been an impact to us of most recently. No, and I missed the the big segue, but of course disasters. You know, the, our 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 inability to be funded 
appropriately at the federal level has caused us to issue debt to fund disaster work um, that otherwise we'd have roads across the county that would be um, in poor condition, but we, we didn't take that route. We, we put the residents first and we tried to get as much uh, built out, but we did have to issue debt and that's gonna come in a couple of years with some new debt service costs for the county. Our final budget, we, we uh, brought forward um, today for consideration is a $1.15 billion, $1 billion countywide budget of which 779 uh, million is attributed to the general fund. The general fund is effectively balanced, but it's relying on $6.9 million, $6,884,000 that would be funded either through budgetary savings or more likely um, we're counting on some available fund balances that, that this year might result favorably and help offset otherwise. Um, we, we still have some work to do, but we, we still feel confident that our budget is balanced either through the use of re, uh, reserves, uh, better available fund balance, or through budget savings in the coming year. As, crop, as far as total position count, I just want to acknowledge that our position count is decreasing across the county by 24.3 countywide. The major reduction is uh, 28 positions, limited term positions from the end of the COVID pandemic. And then there's some ins and outs. There's 10 positions being shifted from land use and community services and, and community development infrastructure to general services. So you'll see what looks like a, a drop in land use of 6.75. And that's really 10 of those positions are being transferred out into the general government department. I'll finish with, um, there's more information in the board report. Uh, this slide deck will be available to the public as attached to the agenda item. We have the budget hearing and board reports from April 9th, May 21st, May 22nd, um, and all the exhibits that are attached in today's action. So that effectively concludes my presentation. It, it brings to a close our budget hearings and then uh, brings it back to the conclusion of the public hearing for your action. So with that, I'm available for any questions or comments. Very much. Um, if it's okay with the board, I'm thinking to open up for a public comment on this item. I do think that many people who are here present already commented on the budget during um, oral communications. So if you have not commented on the budget, you're able to step forward at this time. But if you commented on the budget already, then you already had your opportunity to speak on this item. So any new people who would like to speak to us on the budget item? Okay, seeing none of there are any new people online who would like to speak to us on the budget item that did not previously comment on it. Yes, Chair. We have speaker. Emily, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, I wanted to call out from a budgetary standpoint for the mountain and county roads that it's simply unsustainable and actually, you know, penny penny wise and pound foolish, as they say, to kind of decrease our maintenance and our repairs. I think folks who've lived on Mountain Charlie Road much longer than myself have noted that the kind of maintenance is not really what it should be. And as we know, when the rains come, the culverts and below the culverts are where things give way. Mountain Charlie landslide is an example of that. I think we have six failing culverts. I think the owner that's nearby Mountain Charlie said that it was rusted out below. I just think we need to think about the long term, we're going to continue to have atmospheric rivers. We're going to continue to have storms. I think we need to think about this on a more sustainable, um, in a more sustainable manner, and in a manner that prioritizes our safety. I'm all for bike lanes, but the level of anxiety and the level of risk that we're at up here is is unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. At this time, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments. Um, let's open up to Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, it's hard to, difficult to think of where to start. I mean, as I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've never been on a board of supervisors over the last 12 months where we've had such a dire situation on our, our budgeting process and it's not because of mistakes that have been made here and i'm not trying to soft pedal you know our responsibilities it's just the natural causes that we've been we've faced in these last seven years of seven natural disasters <clears throat> and 
we really have we're, we're facing a trifecta of of crises. Uh, we have a, a state budget deficit that we don't know how it's going to how severe it's going to be and how hard it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us hard. Uh, we have a federal reimbursement uncertainties that we've said we've been waiting for. Uh, and I understand FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, there have been disasters throughout this nation. They're out of money. And they're, they're not, but we're not getting reimbursed for the needs that we, we think we should get. And I don't know how long that'll take. And then, um, we, we also have now the legal challenge of our local tax measure, too, that we hope we can resolve as soon as possible. Um, and this is in light of seven disasters that we've had. And we're going to be talking about roads a little later, a little later on uh, item nine. And we talked about it somewhat this morning. But you to try to say, OK, if we should get more from the general fund, where are you going to take it from? That's the question. We just heard from a lot of people here about the health care service needs that we have in our county. Uh, believe me, we all know, and I know very well, representing the San Rosa Valley, the road uh, disasters that we've had up there in Mount Charlie Road specifically. But to answer some of the questions, even under these circumstances of what we have done in the county uh, to address some of the health care needs, uh, re health care related needs. I'm just looking at this. We have a crisis, uh, a children's crisis stabilization, stabilization program that's being put into effect. At Watsonville Community uh, Hospital, there's a youth crisis services. We have a low barrier in their navigation centers for the north, mid, and south counties. We're developing permanent supportive housing throughout the county. We've reopened a counter recovery center so we can have people, drugs or alcohol related for the moment. They can go to a recovery center, stay overnight and get don't have to go to jail. These are things that you've asked for and that we've been doing. And I think that that needs to be recognized under these dire circumstances that we've had, that we are trying to address a whole range of health care, human care service needs. And roads is what I hear probably directly more than anything. But. As also, we're grappling with some rising housing costs that, uh, and my hope is that by mid September, um, with, you know, the approval of the state budget, we could, we will have a better idea of where we stand relative to our general fund. And that might be not be until September when the budget has to be approved. So we, we're waiting. We're intense. We're nervous and upset about the whole thing, but we are in a position to say, this is what we have, and this is what we the money that we can have, and we can go do it tomorrow. It's just not there. Um, but even with that said, we have been do, doing a lot of good human care, health care service oriented issues that people need to recognize. This board has, I think, been very forward looking in that. And um, I, I just hope that we can reduce our debt liability and make a critical uh, investments in our roads and parks and homelessness, which was reportedly going down. I don't know if that's true, but um, that and the implementation of Measure K funds, we hope that we can get resolved in the near future. I also hope that uh, we restore more of the general fund contingency. So when the next disaster hit and it's not it's not a, if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen, as we've experienced for the last seven years in a row. Um, we also have to acknowledge that our budget decisions have choices, and this budget protects our labor force uh, from severe cuts as we face uncertainties that exist at the state and federal level. Um, and on that note, I want to really thank and acknowledge, and I mean this sincerely, every one of our workers in the county who make services we, we provide possible. They've been on a tremendous amount of stress with the storms, with COVID, fires, whatever the case may be. Uh, they're at the limit, and we know it, but we don't have uh, the funding available to add more people to that at this point that I can see. So, but people, e they equal services, and we must remember that the truth, and we calculate the value of what we are funding and at what level. Uh, and I, so I really want to, I think our staff needs to be thanked and appreciated for what it is doing under some very, very daunting circumstances that we have in the Santa Cruz County unlike any other county, I think, in the state of California. So um, we've got some big decisions to make, but we don't know what we can do uh, 
how, what decisions we are going to make until we have a better idea of what we are going to be receiving from the state and federal entities that support our services. So uh, I just think it should be recognized we are doing some things for human health care services along the way as we face these crises that we've had. And the road situation is unparalleled, and we're going to get that to that as soon as we can and as soon as we get reimbursed. We have, we have completed numerous projects, as was mentioned. We've done what we can with what we have, and now we just hope we can get more from our state and federal uh, colleagues. And I want to just say, too, in that light, for our state, Senator John Laird, our Assemblywoman uh, Gail Pellerin, and the Central Coast Coalition that's been formed, as well as our Congressman Jimmy Panetta, they are fighting the battle for us in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. I'm much appreciative of the efforts they've made because some of the the rules and regulations about these storm damages, they just haven't fit exactly so we can just put money into it. They're trying to find a way to get, a, get around that or get to a, a deciding point where we can funnel more monetary resources into the roads in particular and the health and human services that we all need. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. It, as we've talked about over the last um, sort of ad infinitum number of budget hearings that we've had on this for the last year or two, we're really transitioning from uh, an investment-based budget to a survival-based budget in Santa Cruz County, where one of the things that's unique about Santa Cruz County is that the majority of our population is in the unincorporated area. There are many counties throughout the state, Santa Clara, for example, where most of the population is within cities. So most of the services that we're talking about, roads, police protection, to a degree, fire, water, they're all provided by municipal entities in the county, then their investments are in particular in the health and human services sphere. For us, the majority of uh, frontline services are provided by a county. And if you look at how counties were set up or established across the country, they're actually not set up or designed to provide frontline services. They're meant to be um, rural service agencies that primarily provide for public safety, i.e. the jail services and then health and human services as federal and state mandated uh, requirements have. So I think that as the community has grown, as the needs have grown, as the realities of old logging roads without drainage that are just tar on top of gravel throughout all of our districts have continued to have folks move in, uh, we're seeing now with the, the climate related disasters, how this is coming to roost. We were able to manage when each thing was episodic, but now that it's becoming a common occurrence, it, it really is a functionally unmanageable situation. And, and I've said repeatedly that I, that I don't envy fu the future board, the next four years in particular in dealing with this, these general fund contingencies might just seem like numbers or names or words, but the number is, is so dangerously low. Uh, it's it's terrifying to think what what the decisions that a board's going to have to make in six months when the winter comes or a year from now uh, after that because of how little money is there. There's no path left. So the first decision the board's going to have to make is refunding the pad before you're even making additional investments in things. And every day you don't make an investment in something, it gets more expensive and it gets, it gets worse. And as we had, um, as Supervisor McPherson noted, as we had workers come forward today, one of the decisions the board made, uh, which I think, and, and actually was led by our CAO, was was to draw that down as opposed to having to release workers. I mean, we prioritized that because we still wanted to provide the services. I think that's important because as we had discussions about, for example, roads and the general fund and contributions, at the end of the day, the things that that equates to are how many sheriff's deputies do you want to cut? I mean, this isn't hypothetical. I mean, you just start naming names. These are the five or ten that need to go. How many parks maintenance workers do you want to cut? And there is... None of these things occur in a silo, as was, I think, evidenced by really well by the public comment about the interrelationship between the public, uh, the public, the criminal justice system and early investments in these kinds of things. Any one of these cuts leads to other downstream situations. I mean, it's a lack of investment in one thing will lead to pretty significant lacks of investments in other places. And 
So I think it's a, it's, it's going to be absent a pretty significant shift in how we receive money coming in, in particular from the federal side and the reimbursement side, uh, a kind of hole that's going to be very difficult for us to dig out of anytime soon. Um, I think that what's before us is both an unfortunate budget and the best possible budget that could be presented given the competing interests and circumstances, but it's not a budget uh, that I think uh, well, if this is, if it continues down this path, it's going to be a budget that unfortunately will be the best possible budget that we can present for the next couple of years. And I think that's going to be one of the real, real challenges. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize I was a little bit rambling in that way, but I, I wish that what we were able to talk about were the massive sets of investments that we're able to make because of the ability of stabilization. And unfortunately, right now, it's just trying to not cross that tipping point that we're so close to crossing. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Coney, I'll see if you have anything else to say, acknowledging that you had a, a good amount of time earlier to make comments on the, on the budget. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll keep my comments relatively brief. Um, so, I mean, I think if we just look at the delta in this budget, I mean, we're seeing a number of departments with 6%, 11% increases, yet a 16% decrease on our roads budget for, for roads maintenance specifically. And as I mentioned, that is uh, fire risk su suppression uh, and, and basic maintenance for, uh, you know, pothole patching, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't create a good message in the community that the county's not going to be doing mowing this year. So do it yourself, right? Especially as we go into fire season. Um, and again, I think we, we could correct that just with the Delta on certain departments. I mean, Public defender is getting a million dollar increase, six new positions, right? Uh, for a total general fund budget of $18 million. Um, now, public defender does great work, but the one service that count, um, the majority of county residents rely on is their roads. And we have to be partners in maintaining them and reducing uh, fire risk and ensuring access. Um, and at the end of the day, $82 million of about $220 million that make up our discretionary general fund are coming from property taxes. And so we have to support property values and property owners uh, in getting to their property. Otherwise, we're, we just, I mean, that is unsustainable if we don't. Um, so that's one piece. And the other thing is, I sure wish that uh, we could define some way out of this as a board. I mean, the only way that I can see that we don't are not just sitting here taking on water is how, how are we going to increase our revenues? Right. I mean, in one clear way is solving the housing crisis, building the units that everyone in our community needs. I mean, and not just, you know, little boxes in the sky, as some critics like to say, but I mean, helping people just, you know, add ADUs or heck do a kitchen remodel, uh, which will ultimately lead to, increased property values and new assessment uh, and more revenues for the county to provide the services that everyone wants. And so that's why I proposed at our last budget hearing that we increase funding for the planning department because it's the only vector I see out of this. And so ultimately, if we need to make cuts in some places, at least in order to define momentum forward towards a solution, I think we need to do it. And of course, the other piece of this is, yes, we need to address the uh, FEMA reimbursement issues. We, I mean, heck, every one of us should be calling our state legislators every day to talk about this 13.4% of the property taxes we get. There's just no way we can keep uh, moving forward with that percentage. And I mean, it's it's amazing we've gotten this far, uh, 45 years down the road uh, with that percentage, but, uh, and it needs to change. Um, but as far as what's within our local control, we need to define a vector uh, to add revenues. And I think ultimately that means investing in housing and investing in roads because it underpins uh, our current property tax revenues. And people aren't going to invest in a new ADU on their property if they can't get there. All right, Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I'll actually, uh, I'll keep my comments. I'll actually keep my comments really brief. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have mentioned before and that we didn't really mention today is that we actually do really have a lot of residents that live and we provide services for in in the unincorporated areas. And, you know, I think that we actually have to provide, you know, 
I, I do agree that we do have to provide, you know, services for the homeowners in in the rural roads. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just not sure that with our budget, you know, that that's the, the you know, 10 million or, you know, 4 million is the approach right now. Um, if even right now is the, the, the right time. But I believe that at some point we do have to approach it in an incremental approach uh, in the near future. Uh, hopefully we're out of this crisis, budget crisis in the near future, and we can address it in a more incremental approach, a million per year for budget uh, every every year. Um, but, you know, it's I think it's a tightening of the belt at this point and hopefully in two, three years, we could um, see the, uh, the coastline and, you know, get out of the water. But, you know, that's where we're at right now. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few comments to make. I, I guess I want to start <clears throat> by uh, thanking our staff uh, for all the hard work that they did on this budget. It's not an easy task, especially given the challenges that we've been facing. But I think, you know, balancing probably the one word that best defines what we've been able to achieve this year. Um, there's a lot of demands in across our county. I mean, roads are extremely important. Fire suppression is extremely important. Um, homelessness is something that we hear about constantly and want to have more services for homeless people, more navigation centers, more uh, treatment centers and services for people who are experiencing addiction. We constantly are hearing about everybody wanting to see us do more. And the reality is that if we had a bottomless piggy bank, we would be doing everything we could, um, but we don't have that. And in fact, what we are faced with currently is the fact that absent the storms that we've been facing, we would be in a very good position. But we are now living in a different world than one that we've probably experienced, where we are constantly seeing the impacts of climate change um, in negatively impacting our communities. And at a variety of different levels, um, I'd say largely at the federal level and somewhat at the state level, we have not been preparing for this. I mean, we constantly still have debates on at the federal level on whether or not climate change actually exists. And yet we're facing all the impacts from it currently right now. And so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very um, sad position that we find ourselves in, but um, you know, we're trying to do the best what we can with the limited resources that we have, you know, and I will say one of the things that we did do this year and that the community supported us on was was passing Measure K and increasing our sales tax revenue. I mean, the fact that we're going to have about $10 million every year coming in to our community to help address some of the concerns that they brought up and that the community had the confidence to support that is really beneficial and it's really going to help. And the saddest part about it is that now we're being faced with a lawsuit that's going to tie that up potentially for who knows how long. And it's really sad that we're in that position because there is money in Measure K for roads. There's money in there for our workers. There's money in there for fire suppression. And there's money in there for affordable housing. And we're not going to have access to that for an indefinite amount of time. And so, yeah, you know, we're, I think that we're doing the best we can. I think that the voters have been supportive of our efforts. And given our current situation, you know, um, we're just going to have to, to, to really try to make make through you know the next few months um, make our way through the next few years and hopefully you know measure k is available in september and we're able to you know allocate more money to a variety of these different services but it's clear right now that if we are to shift funding around there's going to be a cut that has to come somewhere and it be and we have to know what what that cut's going to be and I, i'm sure we'd be hearing from those um people why we shouldn't cut those funding and you know i'll just say we had you know, folks from uh, the eviction defense collab and, you know, they want to see us, for example, give 800 or $750,000 towards tenant protections, which I really want to support. Um, but we know that we don't have that funding right now. And I'm grateful that we were able to keep um, tenant sanctuary alive. It sounds like they've been doing a lot of good work, but they're not, you know, that's not the only group that's requesting more funding from us, you know? So it's, it's one of these situations where we really have to think about how we can use our resources most effectively and um, continue to identify problems, bring in what we can solve 
let's try to do it. And what we can't, let's try to figure out how to be more resourceful. I will say that I just want to appreciate this board support as well. And we have been sending letters to our federal and state representatives to let them know uh, what our challenges have been. We've informed them about the fact that we have to bond $90 million and the impact that that's going to have our community. We've informed them about how um, the federal highway system has been really good at reimbursing us, yet FEMA has not, and the need for more reforms. So we're trying to do everything we can constantly to try to ensure that we're getting the resources that we need, that people are being heard, so that we can put, get our county in a really sustainable place. And so um, while I would like to see increases to a lot of other things right now, I think that uh, we're in a position where the best that we can do is move forward with our current budget. And then in September, We'll get our final budget back. We'll have a better understanding of where the state budget's at. We'll have a better understanding of where Measure K is at. And if we can make some adjustments at that point in time, that's an opportunity to reopen that discussion. And so with that, um, if there's no further questions or comments from the board, I'd like to see if we, there's an action to move the um, the, the, the final budget. Okay. So a motion by Supervisor McPherson. Second. Supervisor, friend. Sorry, Felipe. <laughs> Let's all turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. No. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That motion passes with McPherson, Hernandez, Friend, and Cummings voting in support, Koenig voting in opposition. And so with that, that actually concludes our meeting for today. Um, and so... Thank you all for coming, being a part of the discussion. We hope you can come out in September and please continue to um, advocate on behalf of your community and the problems that we're facing.